was the Ukrainian military's last minute efforts to modernize, enough to deter a Russian invasion. Better question, will I ever learn to stop saying the Ukraine and just say Ukraine? Since 2014, their military is investing millions of dollars into an emergency upgrade program. The reason they're doing this might have something to do with the 130,000 Russian troops currently positioned around the Ukrainian border, threatening a full-scale invasion. How about we just let Russia have some of those military bases in Mexico and we just call it even? Ukraine's state-run defense conglomerate company, Ukrom Brom has been working on trying to replace their old primary infantry weapon, the AKM, with the Ukrainian M4WAC-47, which is an AR-style weapon and a kind of subtle shout out to NATO asking to be adopted. You can swap out the receiver to fire either the old Soviet surplus 762 ammo, which they have stockpiles of, or NATO's 556mm. So the Ukrainian M4 goes both ways. Is it strange that as soon as Ukraine seriously started considering switching from the AK platform to the M4 platform, that's when Russia really started considering invading. Nope, must be a coincidence. Putin would never do anything petty. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, one of the largest territories that they lost, with 44 million people, was the country of Ukraine. They voted overwhelmingly for independence at the time. And this was a major blow to the Soviet Union's chances of consolidating their power. What's crazy though, is that all of those former Soviet military forces that were still left on Ukrainian soil were instantly inherited by Ukraine. It would be like if I died on your property, so you legally got to keep everything that was still in my pockets. So basically an iPhone 5S and $12.42. Overnight, Ukraine had the largest and most powerful army in all of 1990s Europe. They had acquired 780,000 troops, 6,500 tanks, 7,000 armored vehicles, 7,200 artillery pieces, 1,100 combat aircraft, and about 1,000 tactical nukes. Those nukes were so tactical. The reason this powerful military force was stationed there was because of the strategic importance and the geographic location of Ukraine. The Soviet Union had spent decades investing in Ukrainian military before their collapse because this was the front door to Europe and it was their first line of defense against any invasion. Ukraine started off with this huge arsenal. The grouping was purposely designed for waging combined arms warfare and nuclear warfare against NATO. Can we stop to appreciate the irony of that for a second? This fighting force that was created with the express goal of fighting NATO has now today become funded by NATO for the opposite purposes. But my point is you would think that this massive 1991 Ukrainian military force would be well suited to defend itself today. So for instance, they inherited the whole Black Sea fleet of 500 ships and 25,000 Marines. But this immediately led to a conflict that is kind of a microcosm for today's issues. After the initial split with the Soviet Union, the majority of officers of the Black Sea fleet were still loyal to Russia and they butted heads with the pro-Ukrainian sailors. The pro-Ukrainian sailors said that the Russians were, quote, drunkards and villains who harassed their families. Awesome, we're off to a great start here, people. You can see how this force was being divided and torn in two different directions. So what decisions led to this massive force deteriorating? How did this once powerful Ukrainian military fall apart? We're about to find out why some people call it the lost army of the gained state. I think it's really important to look at this because the deterioration of the Ukrainian military is a major warning to us all. Anytime you hear someone say, hey, why don't we cut that defense budget? That's a big waste of money. I have an idea. Let's get rid of our weapons as a sign of goodwill. This is the story of the rise and fall and rise again of the Ukrainian military. Please remember to take a second to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Hey, Spare Parts Army. This video was made possible thanks to our sponsor, Lord of the Board. It's a free to play backgammon game. Did you know backgammon is one of the world's oldest strategy games in existence at a whopping 5,000 years old? It actually originated in Iraq, in the good old Mesopotamia. Potamia. Lord of the Board Backgammon is a free-to-play video game that's available on your iOS or Android phone. So be sure to click the link in the description to download Lord of the Board now and get 500 free coins. This backgammon game was actually really popular with officers and soldiers back in the Crusades, where they would wager huge sums of money so this game has a long-standing tradition with the military. Over the past year, they've released new updates to the game from time to time, which keeps it fresh. If you're not familiar with Backgammon, that's no big deal. This app has a great tutorial and guide that helped even the most rookie of players like myself learn how to play this game and have fun. The main objective of the game is to move all 15 of your checkers off the board first. 
I roll the dice each turn and move my checkers a number of spaces based on the dice. It's an online multiplayer game, so I was instantly paired with a one versus one opponent. Personally, I love the game's excellent design, the unique table designs, and the daily free bonus prizes. I really enjoyed playing this game, and I know my tactically minded viewers will too. If you think you can beat me at Backgammon Online, then click the link in the description to download Lord of the Board Backgammon, and I'll see you in game. In order to understand how Ukraine lost their tremendous army, we need to go back to May 1992, when they were under tremendous peer pressure from the international community. Ukraine signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, where they agreed to give up and destroy all their nuclear weapons and become a non-nuclear state. We won't let anything bad happen to Ukraine, just give us the nukes and we'll make sure that you're safe. Maybe we'll even let you join our clubhouse NATO. The 43rd Rocket Army was stationed there in Ukraine at the time, and it was the third largest nuclear arsenal in the entire world. Ukraine chose to give up nuclear weapons when the former Soviet Union dissolved. Your decision has made the Ukrainian people much safer and more secure. But I want to put forth a potentially unpopular opinion. I know getting rid of nukes sounds like a good idea on the surface level, but I can't help but think, what if Ukraine had held on to those weapons? They might have been able to deter Russia and stop all of this current drama from ever happening in the first place. We'll never know. What we do know is this massive, over 700,000 strong Ukrainian military that they inherited started to fall apart almost immediately. Apparently, it was nice to have all that funding from Daddy Soviet Union, who was paying the bill for that large military that Ukraine had inherited. The military cost is too damn high. There's also the theory that some of this deterioration was caused by Russian design. Before the war, during the regime of Yanukovych, the Ministry of Defense was headed by Russian agents. Two successive ministers of defense were Russian citizens, and they completely destroyed our units of high readiness. They undermined our capabilities. So in 1996, the major downsizing of the Ukrainian military began for financial reasons. Military spending is usually the first thing on the chopping block during peacetime and economic recessions. The Ukrainian military at the time thought the need for massive armies was a thing of the past and would be unnecessary in the future. The second president of Ukraine, a guy named Leonard Kamach, really wanted to invest in new weapons like the T-84 tank and the BMP-1U to offset the downsizing. He said, quote, the threat of Russification is a real concern for us. Listen, nobody understands the consequence of reunification better than me. I'm constantly battling my eyebrows attempting to reunify as a unibrow. So Ukraine wanted a strong military to deter Russia from trying to yoink them back up again. But once President Kumach found out that the price tag for upgrading their military would be huge, he said just kidding and chose to rely on the aging Soviet supply of weapons. So you see how the whole history of Ukrainian armed forces is characterized by reduction and defunding. By 2001, the number of tanks was 10 times less than their original number, the other armored vehicles like troop transports were decreased by 5 times the amount and sold off to other countries around the world. So in the beginning of 2013, they were in this situation when the military had downsized to about 180,000 soldiers, about 700 tanks, 170 combat aircraft, and 22 warships. This was a moment of opportunity for Russia. They saw Ukraine was weak. In 2014, when Russian troops invaded eastern Ukraine and annexed Crimea, we watched in horror as their forces defeated the Ukrainian military. Many pro-Russian troops from the old Soviet Union units that Ukraine had inherited used this as an opportunity to defect. At this point, what remained of the military units that Ukraine had inherited from the old Soviet Union lost their final vestiges of connection to the Soviet Union. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko ordered in 2015 that the units remove all citations that were from the Soviet era. Cool, there go all my promotion points. Thanks for that, Mr. President. I don't need any of those to show off at the bar or anything. The Euro Maiden protests of 2014 were all about the Ukrainian people wanting to remove then-President Viktor Yanukovych. During the 2014 conflict, we saw how unprepared the Ukrainian military was. After years of corruption and neglect had taken its toll, they were brave, but the soldiers barely had access to the most basic of supplies like boots and ballistic helmets. They fought in beat-up sneakers and had hand-me-down flak jackets. It's like my old squad leader used to always say, no boots, no helmets, no war. This is what had become of the lost army of the gained state. But the real question is, can the Ukrainian military bounce back and make changes to reverse their military situation? Can they gain back the lost army? 
Since 2014, the United States has pumped $2.7 billion into the security assistance for Ukrainian forces. This includes 300 of the high-tech Javelin anti-tank and Stinger anti-air missile systems. Their military spending has increased from 1.6% of their GDP to more than 4% as of 2021. The United States has had Florida National Guard unit soldiers helping to train the Ukrainian troops on these weapon systems. These Florida Army Guard soldiers were removed from the country recently to prevent a case where Russia invades and they get caught in the attack and this causes the whole world to be dragged into the World War III. Still wouldn't be surprised if Florida finds some way to end up being involved in World War III somehow. Yukon Brom Prom has been accused of having a ton of problems with corruption, which they've tried to address with recent reforms, but Transparency International still rates them as very poor. Ukrainian soldiers have since been issued better cold weather boots, ballistic helmets, and sophisticated communications equipment that they lacked in the last go round. They fortified a line of 400 kilometers between them and the Russians. If Russia were to come knocking again, they would be far better prepared and ready to put up a better coordinated fight this time around. Ukrainian troops have been gaining combat experience and confidence over the past eight years in battles in the Donbass region. They've even been training civilians to be ready to fight. Their forces are racing to try to incorporate NATO reforms that are really important, like making their civilian leadership in control of the armed forces. These are military principles that we take for granted in NATO, which are not present in every military around the world. Historically speaking, you have to understand, the Ukrainian people have been on the worst end of some of the Soviet Union's atrocities. On the other hand, Ukrainians share most of their culture with Russia, and a large portion of them speak the Russian language. They were a part of their country for the last 100 years. Just so you know my bias and where I'm coming from, I feel like maybe Russia is being reasonable and demanding NATO to stop messing around on their doorstep, but that doesn't change the fact that many people living in Ukraine would be horrified to return to living under their authoritarian control. But I think I can speak for a lot of us when I say, as your former average infantryman, I'm praying for a peaceful resolution there. Thank you for watching Spare Parts Army. Please leave a like and a comment below if you enjoyed this content and check out this video about the worst ambush in the Afghan war while you're here.